I have the pleasure of introducing tonight's speaker. It's Jim Sorensen, KA4IIA. He's a senior program manager with Scientific Research Corporation, SRC, a privately held DOD uh, contractor based in Atlanta, Georgia. For the past 20 years, Jim has worked to support the U.S. Uh, Air Force programs, providing engineering reachback for the Joint Pacific Atlantic Range Complex, JPARC, in support of U.S. and multinational military training exercises. Jim has a passion for transmitter hunting, or tea hunting, for over 27 years and been involved in building several types of tea hunting equipment. In 1990, Jim developed a successful testing and switching amplifier modification for the Roanoke Doppler that was featured in the March 1996 73 magazine in the Homing In column. When Jim is when Jim is experimenting with new tea hunting equipment and techniques, he's active in his church. Jim is married and has two children. Please give him a warm narco welcome. Thank you, I appreciate it. So, um, I guess I spoke here, what, a year or so ago? I can't remember exactly, 2017. Um, how many people were here during that presentation? Just a few, okay. And then, uh, I'm just trying to gauge the audience. How many people are real familiar with uh, transmitter hunting and direction finding and fox hunting and all that good stuff? All right, so there's about a, a good mix. And if I remember correctly, there were several people in here that actually, uh, I think, knew it better than I did. So chime in. And we'll, we'll make this a, kind of a group study on this. Uh, and I understand that we have a, we want to try to break at nine. So I could, I've got 40 slides, and I can do a slide a minute, or I can make it slower or faster. So if you have any questions on any of the slides, uh, feel free to ask, and I'd be happy to try to either figure it out or make something up, and, but we're going to have fun doing this. Um, so one of the things I guess I was talking about before uh, the meeting is that here in the South we don't seem to have as much fox hunting or transmitter hunting as some of the other portions of the United States. I'm thinking mainly of California. They have a, a lot of them over there. and It would be really great if we could start getting that interest uh, sparked here uh, because it's a lot of fun. I don't know if you've ever been on one, but uh, starting off at uh, breakfast in the morning with a bunch of people and then going out and, and driving around and then walking around through woods and stuff like that to me is a lot of fun. All right. Oh, I forgot that I did these things. Okay, so this is the agenda for tonight. Uh, we already had the introduction. I'm going to talk briefly about the history because we've got a lot of other stuff that we want to dive into. Uh, the applications of, of tea hunting or transmitter hunting, uh, the equipment, some of the advanced equipment, uh, some software. Uh, if you're going to go ahead and run a hunt or do, uh, be in a hunt, you might want to know what I would call the phases or, or the processes of the hunt. Some of the tips, and then we'll have a question and answer se uh, session after that. Okay, well this is a really cool looking uh, picture here. I got that off of, I think, Wikipedia. Uh, in the bottom, I don't know if you can read it, it says WG Wade of the National Bureau of Standards using a large multi-loop antenna to form RDF in 1919. So, They've been doing this for a little while, and you can see how big that is. And of course, most of you know that uh, the size of the antenna has a lot to do with the frequency. So back then, they were doing a lot of uh, DFing at the, the lower frequencies. Uh, but, but the point or takeaway on this slide is they've been doing radio direction finding from the very beginning of radio, um, mainly because they wanted to try to figure out where they wanted to concentrate the energy, just like you guys do when you're trying to work. Uh, uh, DX. So the, you know it's, it's really it's really good to know where the transmitter is or the receiver is on the other side so that you can turn your antenna. Uh, and then a little tidbit there if you're ever on Jeopardy, uh, John Stone was granted a patent in 1902. So that just shows you how long that this has been going on. And I love this picture here. So it says uh, there's a, a British post office RDF lorry in 1927. He's standing on top of his uh, RDF mobile, and I guess he's uh, adjusting his loop antenna and trying to figure out where there's an unlicensed amateur radio transmitter. So they were serious about it back then, uh, to get somebody up on top of a, a vehicle like that. Um, and, and most of you probably know that uh, radio direction finding was key in, in uh, World War I and II. 
I actually meant to take the German ships off because uh, it was used to locate American and, and uh, all kinds of uh, nationality of ships. So they were using RDF or location techniques back in World War I and II, and it became very prevalent in World War II. It helped actually to limit the German U-boat uh, attacks, which was prolific at the very beginning of the war. If you know your history, uh, German U-boats were decimating uh, a lot of uh, ships that were coming across the, the ocean to help uh, bring supplies and stuff over to help, uh, help fight the war effort. And then at the bottom there, I don't know if you can see it in the back, but there's one of the Wallen, uh, Wallen Werber arrays. Uh, those were developed um, during the Cold War to help DF. Uh, it was actually designed by a German, and then of course the rest of the world figured out how to, to make them too. So the United States made them, Russia made them, and Ger uh, Germany made them. As I understand, there's one or two still in commission, and there's I think one or two of them in the museum that kept the whole site. But uh, they were able to, to DF from uh, about 1.5 megahertz, I believe it is, all the way up to, to 30 megahertz with that, with very high uh, resolution. And of course, you've got those around the world. You can uh, pinpoint a uh, HF station pretty quickly. All right, so applications. Why do we, why do you, we even care? Uh, well, I threw the military up there because I do a lot more stuff with the military. Uh, we actually had a contract uh, for a while where we were working with the military to help uh, train them on a lot of electronic warfare, uh, some of which has to do with using direction finding equipment to figure out where the enemy troops are uh, when they're communicating. So uh, you'd obviously use that to, to try to find out where the enemy is, if they're going to transmit, you can kind of figure out where they are. Uh, radar, um, radar is used. Uh, now, radar can tell you range and, and azimuth, but if you get a couple of them, you can quickly make sure that that's a, a, a real location and you can triangulate on it. So the military uses a lot of, uh, of radio direction finding. And um, if any of you use the GPS on the way over here, that was developed for the military, and that's, that has everything and all to do with radio direction finding. You were using multiple satellites to figure out where you were, Actually, the satellites don't care. Your device used the satellites to figure out where you were. So um, we use radio direction finding equipment in our daily life all the time. And of course, the FCC has mandated that um, carriers like AT&T, T-Mobile, and those are able to determine your location down to some number, whatever it is. And they're, they're having to do that, too. So they can determine where you are just by, uh, I guess, the satellite towers, triangulation there. So with respect to applications, uh, it, it's, it's prolific in our life, even though you don't think about it too much. Um, maritime navigation beacons, a lot of that was, uh, is now overcome by using GPS, but at the time, uh, navigation beacons were, were heavily used. Obviously, uh, ships that are in distress, uh, you want to be able to find them, and of course they have GPS on it. So just because GPS is out there doesn't necessarily mean that you wouldn't want to use some kind of radio direction finding equipment to help find them. Uh, back in the day with aircraft, you've got pilots in here. They, they probably remember the direction finding equipment stuff in there to help figure out where you were. Uh, obviously downed aircraft. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard about ELTs, emergency locating transmitters. So 121.5, I think that they've, they're not using that anymore, is that correct? Yeah, it's, just similar, it's just changed frequencies all. Yeah. Right, I mean, so they're not using the 121.5 anymore? It's, it's 406 now, yeah. but, but the, the 121 is still active right now. Right, okay. Yeah, it's too bad, I think they always, just, they always I don't think they should decommission anything that has to do with emergency, but maybe that's just a resource thing, I don't know. Okay, uh, more applications, LoJack, how many people have heard of LoJack? <laughs> Uh, probably on your computer, right? But uh, you see the four antennas right there on the squad car. Uh, that is a, a direction finding unit. Uh, there's the low jack uh, control module there in the upper part. It's got that five digit code. And if any of you have a radio that can tune to 173075, you can hear that. It'll be squawking all the time. Uh, again, you can turn it on right now, about 10 seconds, it, you'll hear the uh, FSK squ uh, squawks. I don't know what they're doing with that, but they're all over the place. 
Um, I actually played with, uh, uh, on a hunt one time, the, the police in DeKalb County were training and, and I just happened to be on that frequency because I was listening to it and they had a different tone than I'd ever heard before so I decided to use my direction finding equipment. I found their little um, low jack transmitter that they were uh, training with so that was a lot of fun. But that's the control head right there and, and uh, they lock onto that five digit code and then it gives them a bearing as they're driving along. Uh, wildlife tracking, uh, personal safety, we're talking about the 406, so that's the EPIRB right there, and I was reading about the satellites for that, those uh, um, went up I think in the late 70s and they're, they came fully operational in 1982, something like that, and so if you buy one of those EPIRBs, uh, I guess uh, wherever you are in the world, they will uh, they'll find you. I don't know how long it will take, but uh, it's probably a good thing to do if you're a, a uh, hyper or something like that. Okay, all right, so let's get started talking about actually doing it. So this book right here, if you are interested in direction finding, I'm going to pass it around, this is the book to get. And they still, uh, they still sell it. Uh, Joseph Moll and uh, Thomas Curley. Um, it's on uh, Amazon and you can go to that uh, homingin.com website right there and you can buy it there. I think it's in the 17th print. It is dated. I would love for him to, to update that. But everything that I'm going to be talking about, pretty much, you can find a way to either explains it or he has a kit, or not a kit, but a uh, plans in there on how to build it. And the uh, Doppler direction finder that I built a long time ago, um, the circuit board, the circuitry and everything, is out of that. So it's, uh, it's in there. So it's uh, really well done, and my hat's off to him. Uh, those two guys for doing that. All right, so we're going to talk about these items here. We're going to start out with receivers, look at antennas, attenuator sniffers, and a preamp, and how you would use those in a hunt. Now, I usually started out with the antennas, but I started thinking about it. To me, um, one of the most important parts of, of doing this kind of stuff is a receiver, because I, I really maintain that with a bad receiver, it could, it could either make or break your uh, ability to do what you want to do. Um, and we're going to talk about a uh, reason why that is. But just uh, really quickly, looking at sensitivity and selectivity. Uh, sensitivity is the ability to discern a signal, a really low level signal. And the selectivity is the ability to pick that out with a lot of other junk going on beside it. I know a lot of you uh, do uh, HF radio, and it's really annoying, isn't it, to hear that it's that one station that's about, what, 500 hertz or 1,000 hertz off the side, and you're hearing them. When you build a tune off your frequency or your filters, and you can just notch them out and just hear who you're talking to, uh, that's the ability of the receiver to do the selectivity. So that's uh, the ability to get rid of the adjacent channel interference. And you're, when you're going to be doing these hunts, whether it's for fun or whether you're trying to figure out who has a stuck microphone or somebody's jamming a repeater or whatever, um, you might be in an area where there's a lot of um, noise and stuff, a little RF noise going on. So you want to have the ability to, to really get rid of the adjacent noise. And, you know, to be honest with you, I haven't, I, I don't know how to quantify this, but remember back in the days when pagers were going and, and, and you just had internet, I'm internet, intermod all over the place because those pagers were splitting out and just spitting out all kinds of garbage everywhere. It really made uh, it hard when you were trying to find a, a, a transmitter when you have all that uh, RF interference. So the, the receiver is, I really think, is, is, is the, probably one of the most important parts of, of doing this. So we're going to kind of look at one in a minute, but I just want to make that uh, point about the, the sensitivity and selectivity. Um, so back in the day, especially, the, the cost was, was almost directly related to how good the selectivity and sensitivity was. That's, that's changing a little bit with uh, software-defined radios. And we're really not going to talk too much about that, but I'm really amazed at how much a software-defined radio, SDR, can really start cutting out a lot of the interference, even though it's a small um, uh, device that doesn't have a lot of the components that some of the older receivers had. But, but generally, back in the day, if you had a nice Motorola receiver versus, uh, I don't know, some Hamtronics receiver or something like that, there was, 
the, the, the more the more the they spent in the, the cost of it, the, the better it was with respect to sensitivity and selectivity. So I don't want to beat that to death, but I'm trying to, to bring that to the point where if you can get a better receiver, if you want to do fox hunting, that's that's one of the things that uh, you really need to put some thought into. Um, last bullet there, broadband receivers like scanners um, are are nice because they can do a lot of frequencies over a large long large band, but uh, they're not as selective and they're definitely not as uh, sensitive. So just keep that in mind. All right, well, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but um, probably some of you will realize, uh, realize this is a super heterodyne receiver. And I just bring this up just to talk about really quick about the front end where it says the RF filter. And I do have this little, little red thing. Yeah, right in there. Okay. So that front end is important because that's where you filter out a lot of the adjacent uh, channel and uh, that first amplifier there, that uh, has a lot to do with your sensitivity. So that's where a lot of the cost and some of the higher end receivers are and then all the other, uh, you get your mixer and your IF amplifier or your filter and then your amplifier out. But the, the higher end receivers, that's where they, the, the money is spent and they, they have a lot of uh, filter networks and, and things like that in there. So if you can, again, if you can get a better receiver and you want to uh, really uh, shine on, uh, on the hunt, then that's where you want to put your, uh, your effort into. All right, so one of the other things that's really important is receive signal strength indicator, RSSI. Y'all see that little bar right there? How many people have a bow fang in here? Do you have that little bar right there? <laughs> yeah, it just shows up when there's a signal, right? So uh, it was really funny because we were um, we were all kind of playing on it, and we're having a fox hunt and stuff like that. And one of the guys had a nice antenna and a, a nice uh, attenuator and all that, but he just could not find the the hidden uh, transmitter, and it's because he just didn't have the ability to see that little bar right there. Uh, it didn't get bigger or smaller, so he didn't know if he was getting closer or farther. He was trying to listen to the receiver sensitivity, or not sensitivity, but the signal. For an FM signal, it starts getting more, uh, what we call full quieting, it gets a lot quieter, and then you get a little bit further away, and it's a little noisier. That's it. That was the RSSI that he was using, and it just, it, it, it doesn't work very good. So, um, that's important too, uh, is to make sure that you've got uh, a receiver that has that. Um, it, it helps you determine the distance. Uh, so if you start walking away from it, you'll know because that bar will start getting smaller, right? Uh, one little warning right here with respect to, to receivers, if you decide that you are going to use your HT, um, some of the uh, gear that we're going to talk about, the switched equipment, you can damage it uh, if you transmit it either through it or right next to it, I mean pretty close to it. So just keep that in mind. All right, so um, we, we did have a couple of hands go up for people that, that uh, had not seen this presentation or maybe were a little bit new to this, so I will spend just a little bit of time on this. But a loop antenna is a nice little uh, direction finding antenna because it's small and it has a nice little... Battery. Turn it off. I did turn it off. Trying to do that again. Okay, so you can see that, so you're looking down on the loop there, like if you're in the sky, you're a bird looking down on it. And so you'll have a null, or when you're looking at the, uh, this little meter right here, you turn, you turn that an, uh, antenna towards the signal this way, and you'll see that, that signal strength go down very, very quickly as you turn it, and that means that it, the transmitter is either that way or it's that way. So what you have to do is you have to walk someplace else and do another uh, turn of the antenna to figure out is it that way or the other way. So that is one of the cons or uh, issues with this is there is an ambiguous, no, an ambiguous null, which means that you're about 180 degrees in one way or the other and you have to figure that out. There is a little bar you can kind of tap on the side of that that makes it more sensitive this way, but most people are hunting on the nulls on that. So 
if you're if you're just getting into this and you just want to kind of play around with it, this is really a nice little antenna to get. And, and as I understand, uh, there's a couple of companies that sell that. I don't have any on this slide. I probably should throw them up there so people know where to find them. But if you Google that, probably somebody's probably selling it on Amazon. And it's uh, for we do a lot of uh, fox hunting on two meters, so that's actually it's about that big. It's about the size of a basketball in diameter. So it's a nice little. Uh, antenna that you can throw in your car and kind of play with. And then we got the Yagi. And the Yagi has a really large peak in the front of it, which would be this way. So it's, it's going this way. And you can always tell because in the Yagi, the shortest element is the way it's directing. And this is, this is the reflector right here. And then I think this is the driver. The driver. And then you got the three. Uh, director, so the the it's it's looking that way, and that's what the the response of it, it looks like. And you also have nulls on it, but most people hunt with the Yagi on this this peak right here. So on that RSSI meter, you'll see as you're turning it, you'll see that bar go like almost full scale. Hopefully, when you're when you're pointing at it, and then as you're on the back side of it or on the sides, it'll be smaller uh, responses out of that meter. And this little guy right here, I've seen some people at some of the hunts uh, bring these. It's really cool. It's a little tape measure, uh, Yagi, which is great because you can go into brush and woods with it. You won't damage anything. You kind of go running through it. And um, uh, as I understand, people made them and they work really good. So the uh, kind of pros and cons on it, this is low cost. You, you can kind of even make your own. Uh, it's pretty easy to use. And it's good for low signals because you got this really nice response here where it, it tends to, uh, there's what we call gain of the antenna. This gain right here helps to amplify the signal. And uh, so if you have a really low level signal, uh, it'll help pick it out. Um, if you're not familiar with Yagi's, the more of these elements that you have in there, the higher the gain is. And it's also going to be longer. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more near the end because there's some reasons why you might want a bigger antenna. And here is a quad. A quad has pretty much the same response as the Yagi. I didn't put it on here. Uh, it's, it's a little bit cumbersome to go into a car. I know because I've tried to get it in and out of my car a couple times and it's just not as easy to, to work with. But um, it, it, it's a nice antenna. It's very sensitive. Um, in that book that's going around, they have all the dimensions. You can make this out of PVC. and. Uh, these are like arrow uh, pieces of fiberglass or whatever, and then this is just a copper strand wire right here, and uh, it has all the measurements for you. So with PVC and a couple of pieces of wire and some coax, you can make a nice <coughs> antenna, and that has nice gain too. It's a really nice little uh, DF antenna. Okay, so when we were talking about the RSSI, the radius signal strength meter. That works great when you're far away from it. It lets you know if you're far away because the bar gets smaller. And as you start getting closer, the bar gets bigger. But then when you get close to the, uh, the transmitter, you got a little bit of a problem. And that is that that bar just stays long. It's just, it's, it's big and no matter how close or far you get away from it, if you're walking around, if it's in this room and it's a couple of watts, you really have a trouble a trouble trying to figure out where it is. You can buy these little attenuators off of Amazon, or you can make them. They have a some uh, plans in that book on how to make this little like little switched attenuator. And I don't know if you can see this or not, but it has uh, what about seven positions? It has a one dB, a two dB, and it goes up to twenty. So um, if you're really close in, you start switching in the higher uh, dBs, and you hopefully have knocked down the signal, and you can start walking around and as the signal gets bigger you're getting closer and you'll get to a point where no matter how much attenuation you get in you can't get rid of the big bar and we'll talk about that in just a second. We, we had a quarter kilowatt one time and it was none of that none of the attenuators were of any any help. Oh yeah that, oh, how much? A quarter kW. Oh yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
They had a lot of reflections off the building. Continuate that by taking the feed line off the end. All right, so what you needed then was this offset attenuator. Okay, so this offset attenuator, and I've got one of these here, I'll pass it around. Little box right here. Uh, arrow, arrow antenna sells it. That is a really nice little box. What it does is it has a um, it has a little uh, oscillator and mixer in here, and what it does is it, it changes the uh, frequency coming in through the antenna down uh, up, I think up by four megahertz. So what that does is it let's say that you're hunting something at uh, 146 megahertz. You'd go up by four megahertz on that, and so now you're not uh, busting through the case uh, with the RF. You're actually using um, this uh, this um, circuit right here to just uh, convert it so that it's not going into the rest of your radio and overloading the front end of your radio, and it works really good. So you can practice with it. You can practically walk up if you had like three antennas there. You could walk up and touch which antenna and you can figure it out. It's got a lot of attenuation and it works really nice. Um, the company that designed that did a really nice job. The one bad thing with it is it doesn't have a way of knowing that it's on. It doesn't have a little LED, but they only use a little um, coin battery in there. So I guess they're trying to save uh, geostricity, but you want to make sure that you turn it off. But it's a, it's a great little device when you get in really close. Um, and this is one that looks like somebody made. Yeah, so the, the one that I've just passing around is on that uh, Aero, uh, um, AeroAntennas.com right there. Um, I've also played around with one of these. It's basically just a little analog uh, meter movement with, uh, you've got some diodes in there that'll basically detect the, the, uh, the RF coming in and then it's got a capacitor kind of smooths that out and then you can change your uh, your resistance there for the meter for the current on it so you can uh, figure out relative signal strength of that too and you can make it almost as, as uh, sensitive or non-sensitive as you want with that little pot right there that works good too but I think the offset oscillator is the best way to go alright so the other way the opposite side of that coin is and we uh, we had a fox hunt about a year ago and I'm the one who put it on, and I purposely did not want people to hear the the transmitter on uh, when they started out, uh, because there's a there, I don't know, there's a couple reasons. And I'll talk about those in another slide. A lot of times when you're doing a fox hunt, they want everybody to start someplace, and then everybody hears it, and then they go off and do whatever they're going to do. But I wanted people to to work as a team and do some other stuff, so I purposely wanted it not to not to be heard, and we used a repeater, and so we put, uh, we were, I was transmitting on the input of the repeater, and the way that you knew that uh, the fox was going is you could hear on the output of the repeater. And I can't remember, was that with this club, or was that another club? This club. Was this club? Okay. So thank you very much for letting me do that. I jammed your repeater all day when we were doing that, so, but that was fun. I, that, that actually kind of simulates what could happen when, uh, when, when somebody sticks the mic or do it, does whatever. Okay. So if you can't hear it when you start out, you need something like a little amplifier, and this isn't in a box, it's kind of out so you can see it, but you need a little amplifier and maybe a Yagi, and um, you need to get to a high place and start swinging it to figure out where your first bearing is going to be. Um, so it's really nice to have a, a little amplifier. It doesn't seem like there's, um, and I didn't do a lot of looking, but it doesn't seem like anybody's selling a nice little box like that uh, offset oscillator. That'd be nice to have one like that. Uh, maybe I need to do that. <laughs> okay, so we, we looked at some of the basic stuff, and, and all that's really good to have, and I, I carry some of that stuff when, when I do direction finding. I, I have the, the basic stuff with me because uh, it works really well, but sometimes it's also nice to have some of the more advanced stuff, uh, and we'll talk about why that is, but you may remember when we were talking about the amplifier, or not the amplifier, but the antennas and stuff, you have to get out and turn those, or I guess you could stick it out the window as you're going down the road and try to figure out where it is, but that gets a little bit tedious. So we're going to talk about some of the uh, direction finders that uh, you can kind of use as you're driving down the road, and then some of the stuff here is commercial uh, grade, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about that so you got kind of an idea of what's going on out there. 
All right, so <laughs> I, I say time difference of arrival because that's what it is, that's what people call it on the internet, but how many people have ever seen this device here where you have the, the H antennas and it does the little, the little tone? Okay, so how that works is if, um, if this antenna and this anten these antennas are equal distance from the transmitter, uh, there's no tone that comes out of it, and that's because there's no um, difference between one antenna and the other of the signal getting there. But as you start turning it, one antenna gets closer to the transmitter and one gets a little bit further. So that super kind of puts a tone on the uh, on the radio that you have that plugged into, because it, it, it goes into your little HT right there. So it's sort of like the, the um, loop antenna where you, you turn it and you if it's closer this one way then you turn it and you get the null you know it's that way but it guess I guess it could be that way too so you'd have to walk maybe I don't know, a couple hundred feet that way and see if you get a little triangulation but it, I, I made one of these things and it works and it's kind of fun to play with and uh, there's nothing wrong there that there's a uh, set of plans in that book for this and there's a ton of people that have put uh, the plans out on the internet. You're talking about a couple diodes here, here and here, and you got some coax, and this part right here is a PVC, and you know, it's, it's actually kind of fun to make, and it, and it does work. All right, the Elber. So I know there's people that fly in here too, or Civil Air Patrol, maybe? Okay, well, so they don't they don't make this anymore, the little helper, this this piece. Uh, but you can buy it on the internet. Guess how much that thing goes for? Somebody bought one of those for two hundred and fifty bucks. <gasps> Seriously, uh, it's a crystal based unit, and these are wooden pieces that fold up, and then you I guess you unfold it and you hook this up to it, and it's uh, it's at one twenty one point five, and it probably has another couple other frequencies in there for training and stuff like that, but. The Civil Air Patrol, this was their uh, staple direction finder for years and years and years, and I guess there's bunches of them out there. And you go on the internet and you can find all kinds of articles on how to use it. Um, as I understand, it works really well, and some people actually, I think, mounted those in aircraft, and then they would put some kind of uh, antennas on the outside of it so that they could uh, also uh, find downed aircraft with it. This is the more modern version of it, right here. Um, you buy this and, and I think these pieces are on the back of it and you can put it together and you got the little handle there and it's got the display and it gives you kind of a left-right indication. Um, so Eltronics, I try to find out more about them. I don't think they're in business anymore because you go to their website and it takes you to some weird place about water or something like that. So I, I don't know what's going on there but um, I know for a long time that was the big deal for the Civil Air Patrol, and I know that they sold a lot of those things, but um, that unit right there that's in the top right, um, somebody sold that for um, $500, and it was used. So there's still people out there that want them. Okay, the next one is the Doppler Direction Finder. That's a picture of the box right there. And the book that's going around, uh, it's about in the middle. Uh, the plans for for that is in there. It's a it's a it's a nice little design. It was done by um, and I don't know, I can't remember the guy's name now, but they were up in Roanoke, Virginia. Two engineers developed it and then they released it out to the public domain. And um, I'll just tell you a really quick story how I got into doing all this kind of fun stuff. Is uh, I think this is a. Uh, very early 90s, actually late 80s, uh, I was a member of another club and our, our repeater was getting just jammed like crazy. Um, somebody was bringing up the patch, we'd bring it down the patch, they'd bring up the patch, they were calling the police, they were jamming everybody, they were going to all the repeaters in town, they were just doing all kinds of nasty stuff and so a couple of us felt like we are going to go out and get the bad guy, right? So we didn't have any equipment and we didn't know what we were doing and we are just driving around talking to each other on the radio like well, I can't hear him here. Can you hear him over there? Well, I can't hear him over here, and we're just driving around. And I'm pretty sure that the guy was listening to us and laughing the whole time we were doing that. So after a while, I started getting personal. This went on for a while. So then we started, you know, playing with loops and yaggies and stuff like that. And uh, I don't know. He may have been mobile. I don't think we ever caught him. But we decided that. Uh, one of the guys bought that book and we decided we would make 
this, and that's in a nice box, but the one we did before, I won't even show you the picture of it, it looks pretty bad. But um, with the Doppler though, it's really nice because you can take uh, you can take bearings as you're driving down the road. And I apologize that you can't see these. There's a there's a, a ring of LEDs around here that represent your bearing. So uh, basically, as you're driving down the road, at this top LED goes off right here. It means it's straight ahead, and of course, the one on the bottom means it's behind you. And you got your left and right, and it gives continuous bearings as you're driving. Uh, there's 16 there. So that equates to about 22 and a half degrees. Um, and you don't really care about the degrees, you're just saying, hey, I need to go right or left. And um, it, it's really, it, the Doppler direction finders really work nice. Um, the last two fox hunts I went on, they were banned. <laughs> they weren't letting anybody that had one. Uh, you had to use the Yagi or the, uh, the loop. So um, I don't call it cheating, but it definitely is a nice the unit because of the constant variance. They just need to create the automatic class. Yeah. Okay, what now? Create the automatic class for those so they can still compete. Yeah, there you go. Well, okay. So if you want to run a, uh, if you want to run a hunt and not have the Dopplers work very well. Um, yeah, put on two transmitters. Or, or what you do is you just have a quick transmission every five minutes. Yeah. They're just going to sit on the side of the road because by the time they, they see it, they'll have to stop again. Yep. But, you, but the loops and the Aggies can still do that. Or, I mean, it'll take them a little bit longer. That, that makes the hunt longer. But there are ways of messing with these people if you want to do it. <laughs> but like I said, the good thing about it is continuous bearing, very mobile. Uh, so the cons are the costs. Not necessarily so. There are some, and next slide's going to show that. But the cost can be mitigated by, by making it yourself if you want to do that. Um, degrades their uh, receiver performance. So these things are switching, and if you just had one antenna going into a receiver, it's much more sensitive than if you're switching them into four antennas. So it does tend to desensitize the receiver a little bit. So if you have a really, really low level signal someplace, uh, the Doppler folks really can't hear it as well as the guys with the Yagis out there. Um, and uh, then you have multipath. So multipath is when signals are bouncing off of mountains and <coughs> buildings and stuff like that. So if you're sitting there st stopped and you get a bearing on this, it may be that you're getting a reflection. So the best way to actually get bearings with this is to be driving because those multipath um, signals tend to average out as you're driving down the, the road. And it's narrow band only. This thing doesn't really work well with a FM st station. If you want to do uh, 97.1, the river, you're not going to be able to find it with this. It's really a narrow band type device. Um, here's a, uh, some people are taking pictures. If you wanted to know more about the uh, Dopplers, there's, there's a few right there. You got the Doppler systems, which is commercial, but you have the Pico, Pico Doppler and then the Ramsey. So I did a little bit of look on that today. It turns out that Ramsey DDF1 is a knockoff or maybe uh, they got the Pico Doppler <laughs> schematic and it looks like they made it along with this this one, this KN2C, uh, That's I know some people here have that. So this Doppler and this Doppler DDF1 look the same to me on the website. And they just rebranded it. And if I'm not mistaken, I think they got the schematic and the design from this Pico Doppler guy. The Pico Doppler, if you really are good at making things and you want to spend a lot of time building and wiring and doing all kinds of fun stuff, get that one right there because it's six boards and there's a lot of work to do on that. And they even, on their website, they talk about how um, the user will agree to, to, uh, to build this and get somebody who knows what they're doing and there's just all these things that you need to, to realize that you're going to have to do if you buy this because I think they've had a lot of people complain that once they get it, they go, I don't even know what to do with this. It's, it's, it's pretty, pretty in-depth uh, uh, kit, I would say, with that. But the Ramsey one here and this uh, KN2C, uh, uh, there's a little bit of building on it, but it's, it's, uh, it's somewhat full after that, or complete after that. Okay, so here's some stuff that you're probably not going to see on any of the fox hunting. Uh, trips if you go out with a bunch of amateur radio operators, but I just wanted you to know it's out there. Has anybody heard of phased interferometry? One, two, three, okay, four or five. 
So I think that's how they saw the black hole, right? They used uh, radio uh, telemetry or whatever to, to see that. But basically it was started, it was first used with radio astronomy. But basically what you're doing is you're measuring the phase difference. Uh, so if there's an antenna right here and there's an antenna right here, there's a phase difference as that wave front hits those two antennas because they're spatially uh, separated from each other. It's like that one I was talking about where you turn it side to side. So what you do is you do this nice little uh, trigonometric function over here and you do the calculation on, on those phase differences and then you get your angle of arrival here. So uh, a lot of people are not really interested in doing all that and um, I haven't seen any kits where anybody's building that but I can tell you this, there's a lot of interest in this um, that's, that's on the internet now and uh, how many people are familiar with GNU Radio? Okay, so GNU Radio is a really cool program. I love that thing. But there's some people that have developed some of the flows for that for, um, so you can start making these. Now, this is just a two ant antenna solution here. To really get your uh, ambiguity out, you need to have three or four. Um, but this is just to simplify so you can understand. That's why this up here, this array up here, is a circular array of, uh, what is that, five elements. And, and you've probably seen these kind of antennas out there. They're using them for direction finding. They are doing the phase interferometry. It's very high accuracy. You're talking about less than a degree of accuracy. Um, I've not used one of these, but they talk about uh, in the literature that has less vulnerability. Rod Rodian Schwartz is a company that makes uh, equipment like that. We're going to look at one of their professional units in just a moment. But uh, the military uses this a lot. Um, for, for their use and their commercial people um, use it. But I, again, so we wouldn't probably use it on any of our Fox hunts, but it's kind of cool to see what other people are doing. And who knows, somebody might make a, a kit or a, a, a amateur radio version of this, we'll all run by it. All right, time difference of arrival. So I talked about the low tech version, and now we're going to talk about the high tech version. Um, I don't know how many people have heard of TDOA, but it's, it's the time difference of arrival. What does that mean? So you can actually figure out where a transmitter is by measuring the amount of time it takes to get to different receivers. We're going to look at uh, kind of a picture of that in just a minute. But if you think about it, you know, radio waves propagate through space at, what is it, 300 million meters per second. So if you can time that, figure that out, and then time stamp that at different receivers, then you can figure out where it is. And so the military is another one that uses this, and so do some of the high-end commercial, and uh, uh, I think they're even using it for uh, location finding for uh, cell, uh, cell phones and things like that. But it does work on narrow band and wide band, but wide band is much, much higher in resolution and higher, higher accuracy. You can actually, with a wide band signal, you can get down to meters. Uh, and so, I, yes, sir. Isn't that the premise behind GPS? Right, so it's the reverse. So, multilateral, this is multilateralization. You don't know where the transmitter is. On GPS, you know where the transmitters are, but you're the receiver, so it works. In, and the math is actually different. I mean, it's the, the math for this. I thought about throwing that up on a slide, but it's it's a uh, it's multi nonlinear equations that you're having to si uh, simultaneously calculate. So it's 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 not it's a one of those things that computers have to iteratively do to figure out the solution for it. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of work being done uh, in the amateur radio community with SDRs right now for this. Um, there's some people that are doing passive radar, which is another thing the military is doing. What passive radar is, a regular radar is something that sends a signal out, hits the aircraft or whatever and comes back and it says it's that way and it's that far away. But to hide the radar systems now, what they're doing is they're using television transmitters in the area and then they've got these receivers around and as a transmitter the television transmitter hits the the radio or the uh the aircraft it hits these receivers they measure that and they can say that aircraft's over here but they don't know there's a radar that's tracking this right this airplane and and the i can tell you the air 
the Air Force, and the Navy, and all those people are really concerned about that. If you've got multi-million dollar aircraft up there and they don't know there's, they're being tracked passively. So that's one of the ways they're doing is this time difference of arrival here. But uh, if you go on the internet and you look it up, there are, there are some hams that have done some SDR uh, software-defined radio type work that are um, getting this to successfully work. It, they have to do it over the, the internet um, to get the data, and we'll talk about that in just in a minute. But it is less vulnerable to multipath, and it, uh, as I mentioned, the heavy military and commercial usage right now. And so I know there's a, probably a fair amount of people that like to do um, uh, DX here, trying to figure out where maybe their uh, transmitter is that they're talking to. Um, this this website right here has actually got an online TDOA. Yes, sir. It's a part of the Kiwi SDR, yes. and it works very well. It does. That, yeah, but I, uh, it, have you? And you can you can go. You, there's there's over 400 receivers around the world. They're all networked together, and, right? And uh, you can you can uh, pinpoint anywhere in the world. It yes. Really works well. Very quickly, right? I mean, how fast is it? Is it's it? A, well, it takes uh, the processing time depending <clears> on your computers. You know, it can be sometimes. Five, six minutes, but it's oh really? I, th I thought it might be a little faster. Well, it depends on um, how weak and how many stations there are, but it's it's accurate. Yes. So this is just the the hyperbolas, uh, and if you go to the website, you're just going to see little circles all over the place where the transmitters are. But they have a network, the Kiwi SDR. Um, somebody decided to put this network together and put all these things on the network, so. You go on the website and they have real-time positioning of transmitters all over the world that you can see. And the, the reason why I put these hyperbolas up is the math that I was talking about that I thought about throwing up on the slide but wouldn't impress anybody. Um, for, so here's three stations right here that are receiving a signal. And if you calculate the time difference of arrival uh, possibilities for the transmitter, you're going to get these, these hyperbolas. And where they intersect is where the transmitter is. So in this case, uh, on that world globe that comes up here, they would plot a little spot right here. And they would plot it in the color that has to do with the frequency band. I think they, they have, what, four or five frequency bands? Well, it depends. They, it's on how, you know, as it gets closer and closer, uh, sometimes you can't get a very pinpointed thing. Oh, you're talking about the heat spot, but I'm talking about how they categorize the transmitter. They got little spots, and so like a red one is... Yeah, they have different is, types. Right, yeah. It's really a neat project. But uh, So I guess the reason why I bring this up, though, is uh, so ham radio operators are starting to, to take uh, this technology and use it for other things. And, and this specifically... Um, is for the HF band, but you can use it in two meter or whatever. It it does, and, and as you can see, this is uh, was a Spain right here. So to to, to locate something, but uh, you really need to go between receivers. If you're only using these three right here, if you start getting out of that triangle there, you see how the hyperbola gets much bigger. So um, that that's just the that's the heat map that. Uh, you were talking about how the, the probability gets wider as you go away from the receivers. Now, if you have a bunch of receivers, you can start uh, locating that down a lot a lot closer. So that's really probably hundreds of miles, but with, with HF, you probably don't care because you're just going to turn your, uh, your equipment that way to talk to it. So anyway, that's one of the uses for it, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's promising for a lot of other different uh, applications. Okay, so here's just kind of an idea of some commercial direction finding equipment, uh, Rodian Swartz. I don't know what that costs, but I bet it's uh, about half of my house. <laughs> and they, they'll mount it on a truck for you. It's got nice uh, waterfall displays, direction, angle of, uh, and then it'll do all the plots for you. So if those guys are looking for you, they're gonna find you pretty quickly. All right, so I need to start wrapping this up, but let, let's just talk real quick about some of the software. Uh, so when I talk about software, it's nice to go out by yourself and go hunt these people, but it's really nice to work with other people. So if you've got software where you can kind of get this on the internet and, and plot it with other people, then you can start doing some triangulation. All right, so APRS has had this functionality from a long time ago because I, I don't know if any of you have ever talked to Bob Bernica, but I met with him at a... At a uh, 
Cracker Barrel one day and we talked about how we would do this DFing thing and he actually put the ability to put um, uh, the, uh, I know this is the way that car is going, but he was able to, to plot um, be, uh, beam headings on there and he put that in there and that's been in there for a while, I think it's since 1990 something or other. So that's had that ability. Also, they, he put these fade rings in here, or fade circles, and that helps you also know where it isn't and where it might be. So if you have APRS and you want to look into that, that's kind of a neat little, it, it is, I think it still has it in the software. I, I know there's uh, Windows versions of it now that, uh, that I don't know if they preserve that functionality, but it's, it's been back in a long time ago. And that, that would have been really good if we'd have gotten all that working back then because then you'd have had multiple stations. Uh, the Google Hunt GPS, uh, that comes with the, um, that K2NC um, for free. I think you, it, it'll, uh, it'll interface with it. This is the user interface right here. You can put a manual bearing in or you can uh, get the automatic uh, Doppler readouts from it. And uh, it'll plot it on Google Earth for you. Um, here's a couple apps. I think there's three or four of them, but I've got just the, th uh, the two right here. The Fox Hunt Pro are for the iPhones. And the Sig Tracks has been out for a while. It's for Android and iPhone. I actually just downloaded this the other day. I'm kind of playing with it. Uh, looks kind of neat. It has the ability, I think this does too, that you can share beams, um, beam information from multiple hunters. Unfortunately, with Sig Tracks, you have to pay for that. I don't know about Fox Hunt Pro. I think you do have to pay a little bit more to share, but with Sig Tracks, um, I hope he comes down on his price a little bit on that because I think it'd be a nice, a nice tool for uh, for ham. And it'll also plot on uh, Google Earth to using KML file. All right, so we're down at the last part of this, but the phases of the of the fox hunting. So. You got to get ready for it. That's pre-hunt, and then you got to you want to find the signal, uh, or at least try to start uh, figuring out where it is. And then you'll be hunting, and then uh, you may have to you may have to get out of your car and actually go find where the person stuck it behind the tree. Yep. All right. So the pre-hunt, you want to make sure that you get all your parts and pieces all together because uh, you're not going to have time to go back and get it or maybe borrow it from somebody else. So we talked about how important receivers are. Uh, definitely your antennas or your direction finding equipment is important. Um, I don't have a preamplifier, but if you've got one, that'd be nice to throw in there. And with your attenuator and your offset attenuator and your mapping software, GPS, and if you have any of the advanced stuff. So it's nice to have all that stuff ready to go when you start. Uh, and then finding the signal, like I mentioned before, sometimes you... Um, you can't really hear it from the very beginning, so sometimes you have to figure out where it is. So I recommend going to the highest spot. That's kind of one of those obvious things, but um, I before some of the hunts, sometimes I try to bring up the topo map and figure out where all the high points are in the area, so I won't have to figure out where they are when we're when we're playing fox hunt. Um, you want to use your low noise receiver we talked about and your preamp. Uh, in your amp. So what I do is I have an 11, 11 element 2 meter beam. <laughs> I stick it in there and it, oh, it comes apart and then when I go someplace I put it all together and it's really unwieldy and it, it's really big and all that but um, if, it, if it has somewhat of a signal I can usually hear it when a lot of people don't so I can get a quick bearing and figure out which way to go um, when the guys with the Doppler are sitting there trying to figure out if it, it's even on or not. So it's nice to have the high gain or the Yagi's. But sometimes the low-tech stuff gets you started. Um, obviously, uh, we, we were talking about bearing and triangulation. So um, the takeaway from this slide is here's kind of a, a mountain peak here. I know we don't have any mountains in Georgia, but real mountains. Here's a mountain here or a high point here. You want to try to get on those two points. Maybe you get your friend over here to go here, and then you go over here, and then you're going to really hope that the, the transmitter's right there, aren't you? And you start driving down there. A uh, couple things to remember. Uh, altitude is king. If you can stay on the high ridges and in, in the high areas and you're getting bearings, that's a lot better than getting down into the valleys. Unless you're in the valley where the transmitter is, and then that's really good because then uh, nobody else knows you're down in there and you can find it. 
Um, you want to stay away from large structures like large buildings or, or power transmission lines because they're just going to mess with you. Uh, I mentioned before the Doppler DF uh, is better as you're driving down the road. Um, you want to keep track of the signal strength. Uh, if you're by yourself, you have to do that mentally. You have to say, hey, if I was on the south end of the county and my RSSI was really high down there and now I'm on the north end of the county, I can't hear it. You probably want to turn back around and go to the south end of the county, but you just yeah, that's really nice to keep that in your mind how that's going. Uh, plot your good bearings as you go, and beware of the reflections. Um, here's one thing I, I'm going to tell you. This this is probably a secret that I should give away because it really has worked for me great. Um, if you got a cheap little scanner like this, that's really good for nothing. Doesn't have the RSI or anything on it. Put that on the frequency that the fox is on, take the antenna off and just throw it in the back seat and keep it on. And as you're driving down the road and you're getting closer and you're getting closer and you're getting closer and your RSI meter is pegged and you're trying to figure out where it is, all of a sudden you hear the squelch break in the back seat, you just drove by it. <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you, I have found so many transmitters that way and that's low tech. I mean, you're, you're, with, you're within 20 feet of it or if it's high power, you're within, you know, a tenth of a mile anyway. Uh, let's see. All right, here's a little scenario, and then I think it's we're over. So, you got two teams right here: the black team and the red team. They start out the same place, and they hear that there's a transmitter on the fox hunt, and so they get the bearing. Their their first bearings are going this way, right? And so the black team says, oh, "We're just gonna we're gonna get on the road. We're gonna shoot up this road real quick." and we're going to be the first one there. And the red team's like, you know, I don't know where it is, but I just remember this guy that came to our meeting, he was talking about going to a high spot. So I think what we're going to do is we're just going to ride up this road. We're going to get on this little peak right here, and we're going to see if we get a better bearing. So this guy's like trucking it up here, and he gets right up here, and all of a sudden the bearing goes this way. And that's because the transmitter's right there. It's a Yagi that somebody stuck down this little valley over here. And so this red team sitting there and they're driving up the road and they get up on this little peak and they go, ooh, I got a bearing right in there, so I'm going to drive down and I'm going to find it. And these people have to come down here and they lose the fox hunt. So the moral of that story is, uh, if you think you know where it is, you might not know where it is. Try to get to some of these high points around here and take bearings as you go. Uh, and Because this scenario has happened to me before where I thought I knew where it was and I get someplace and it was actually over here. Quick question, are they yes, continuously yes, transmitting or are they transmitting on a schedule in, in this scenario? I mean, oh, um, it doesn't make any difference. I mean, it could be, most fox hunts they transmit for a while and then they go silent and they transmit for a while. But, but because if it's like every 10 minutes mm -hmm. and, they tra and they transmit for two minutes, that prompts you to kind of stop and you can actually double check the bearing. Exactly. So that's the reason why I asked. Exactly. Yeah, rarely do any of the fox hunts go continue. The, the only time I've ever seen continuous stuff is when somebody's microphone is stuck in their car and you're trying to find it and they just sit there and transmit forever and a day. Uh, but yeah, usually for the, the fun fox hunts, it's a, it's a time thing. And if they're really sticking it to you, they're doing it every like half a second, half of, just for a short time, and then they wait a long time and you're sitting there on the side of the road. All right, so um, we were talking about the RSSI. Here's another example. So let's say you get into the area and you see this field. Okay, where is it? I don't know, is that little white thing there? Or that little, is it right here? So it's really nice to have an RSSI or maybe that offset uh, attenuator to get down in. Hopefully none of this is poison ivy. I can't imagine people <laughs> cultivating poison <laughs> ivy here, but you know, who knows, somebody might be hiding in a bad place like that. <laughs> All right, so I highly recommend working in teams. It works much, it's more fun that way, coordinating on using maybe the software, the apps, talking to each other on uh, Simplex or maybe over the phone, um, using, you know, like I said, the, the apps here, Google Earth or some of the other stuff. Um, one of the other things, I don't know why we don't do this more. I've been on a lot of these fox hunts. I never hear anybody calling to a base station. Hey, Fred, hey, we're going to have a fox hunt on Saturday at 8 o'clock. Would you do me a favor and would you swing your 300 element beam around <laughs> and give me, uh, you know, this this indication? Yeah, sure, I'll do that. And then he gives you one, and you're over here, and man, like you got an instant triangulation, you can go that way. 
So I would enlist any of the fixed stations. There's people that don't want to do this, maybe, but they might want to be part of the fun. So <clears throat> it'd really be nice to, to get some uh, fixed bearing. And, and if you're doing it because of malicious, that's, that's even more, uh, that's even better. And then I'd be safe, have a co-pilot. I can't tell you there's a couple times where I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that I almost ran into the back of a car. So you really need to make sure that you got somebody with you that's, that's maybe watching the DF equipment while you're driving. What's the basis for your bearing? Do you have a magnetic compass? Your phone! Uh, you want a lot of bearing, how are you going to come up? Well, it depends on what you're using. So if you're using the, the antenna, or so whatever you use True North for your reference. So How do you know where that is? Your phone! Well, you, so you have a... Well, phone does have a compass on it, but you'd have a... So if you're going to take a bearing, I have a, so I have a compass that I, that I have. Use a or on my phone. But if you're doing the Doppler uh, and you're plotting all software, it automatically knows which direction you're going and takes to true, true north. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Is it multi-path a serious issue? Yes. It, it, uh, you know, so just to give you an example, um, has anybody around here participated in any of the balloon launches that came out of Huntsville or any of the balloon launches that have been done lately? So we used to use the Doppler to, to locate the balloons and they would go up, what, 50,000 feet? No multipath up there. When it was up, the Doppler just sat there and tracked it with, I mean, you never saw it flutter or anything. If we could go up in an airplane with the, this direction equipment, you, you, you would always be seeing where the transmitter is. There's just no reflections. It's down on the ground that things bounce off and get attenuated by the foliage and all that. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yeah, Jim, uh, one of our repeaters had a weak signal on the input several years ago, and we started doing some DFing, and I went to a place, went to another place, went to another place. The signal just kept going further and further and further away, and it turned out that it was on top of one of the mountains in North Georgia, at another repeater site where a transmitter had gone, you know, wacko, and you know, it was 60 miles away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That's a lot of driving. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's really hard. To, I mean, you're going to have to get away from the repeater, and you're going to have to swing a Yagi in with the amplifier to find that. Yes, sir. And one thing to probably mention is if you make your own uh, directional antenna, mm -hmm. just to make sure you use a balance with it. Otherwise, you get the skew and the, the squint and the... Right, and the yes. Can, you can lead you off track. Right, so if you make your own, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be uh, an unbalanced right. antenna. So, dial. so it's like a dipole, so you really need to have a balance yeah. to convert it over to the coax, I agree. But otherwise, it'll, it'll skew you away from the true direction. Right, yeah. So in, in that book that's passing around, he has all kinds of plans on how to do that, or you can buy the commercial balance, or, or they have matching networks that convert it over for your coax and things like that. Well, hey, I want to say something about this club. I've been to a lot of clubs, and you guys seem to make it fun. You know, you guys look like you have a lot of fun, so I appreciate you having me here, and I'm going to turn it back over to the president. Oh, one last question. So when's the fox hunt? <laughs> so, I have a DF box, I mean a Fox box, if anybody ever wants to borrow it, it's a, you can put your uh, call sign in if you want, uh, it's autonomous so you can chain it to a tree, it's an ammo box, put it on there and you can borrow it anytime you want, I'd, I'd be happy to let you use it, for a box in it. Alright, thank you Jim.